Well, last Sunday I made a request of you, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with you guys. At least three of you have confessed to me that you have read the book of Ecclesiastes, and I asked you not to read it. And two of you said you got halfway through, right? <laughs> Didn't I say that's the way it would work? Well, today we're doing the rest of the story, part two of uh, Don't Do Dinky. So, DJ, if you can go ahead and put that up there. Uh, well, not that man yet, but the uh, PowerPoint. We'll get to that man in just a few minutes. Let's keep on going. Last week we introduced this book. It's an amazing book. It's an incredible book. Ray Steadman said this about the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, It's the only book in the Bible that sees life from man's point of view instead of from God's point of view. And he goes on to say, It is a book that is full of error, yet it is wholly inspired. And it, it really is. This book has grown on me the last two weeks as, I, as I've gone over and over and over it. In fact, I uh, went ahead and found it on my phone so I would, could listen to it as I was driving. I do a good bit of that, listening to the whole book of Ecclesiastes all the way through. done it a number of times the last two weeks. And uh, there's more in this book than actually I was thinking about three weeks ago when I started staying, studying it in preparation for these messages. But one of the things you learn from the book of Ecclesiastes, DJ, if you'll go to that next slide, is sometimes a trip of a thousand miles ends very, very very badly. And Solomon is telling us, don't get on that boat. Because he's a man who knew better. Oh, he knew better. And yet, he violated all of the boundaries. And uh, he had the scars to show for it. And this book is his confession. And he's trying to tell us, hey guys, I've done this. I did it. You don't have to do it. Learn from my example. And that's why we have this really amazing book in the Bible. You know, uh, just for those of you who weren't here last week, well, this is how Solomon starts out in this book. Go ahead and go to the next slide, DJ, with this word that he repeated 38 times in this book. Meaningless. And some of your translations has vanity. Worthless. He goes on meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors of which they toil? But then there's three key words. Under the sun. And he goes on to say, it's not on the slide, the next few verses. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had told to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind... Some, tra some translations say chasing after fog or vapor or a cloud. Nothing was gained. And here's that key phrase again that he repeats 20 times in this book. Under the sun. That phrase, under the sun. Next slide. There it is right there. Under the sun. What in the world does he mean by this phrase, under the sun? Well, it's really a Hebrew idiom. And some of you who've studied or speak second languages or three, you know that sometimes idioms carry great meaning in their original language. But then when you try to translate them, you miss it. And some of us know some of those in Spanish that when we, we say them to people who are learning Spanish as a second language, they don't get it. Well, this was one of those idioms. It was a Hebrew idiom. Under the sun means this, life without God. It's what it means, life without God. And C.S. Lewis went on to say about this, here we get a cold, clear picture in the book of Ecclesiastes of life without God. This morning, Pete and I were talking about, you know, August always means for some of us that dove season's coming soon. And uh, one year I was driving back from a dove hunt, it's always in September and it's always hot. And I was coming back late at night. My brother and I were in my 63 Ford pickup. And uh, we came down a hill. I was decelerating, you know, coming into town. And uh, my engine threw a rod. Wham! We pulled over. Oil's running out onto the ground. And that's a picture of what it is to live life without God. See, an engine was designed to, to have oil in it, wasn't it? And if you run that engine without oil, what happens? 
It comes apart. And that's what C.S. Lewis was saying. To live life without God is like being an engine running with no oil. And it will eventually come apart. Solomon's life came apart. And he confessed that in his book. Hey guys, here's the pieces. You don't have to do this. And when we were in Guatemala, Kelly and I, the catchy people with whom we worked had a radio station. They were really, really proud of that radio station. It was a shortwave band because it, it uh, needed to, to be able to, to extend all of the inhabited area of the Ketchi people, about a half a million people. And so it was their means of communication. They had no phones. And so Radio Ketchi was their lifeline. And when a little baby was sick and they needed a doctor, guess how they got the word out? On Radio Ketchi. So this was a real important tool for the Ketchi people. Well... The electricity in the little town of Las Casas, where the radio station was located, it just kind of came and went. And it was that, that way where we lived. Every evening, about 5 or 6 o'clock, we had what was called a brownout. And I had to have a UPS, uninterrupted power supply, on my computer, because the power would go down. And in Las Casas, the power would go out. And then when the power was out, they didn't have a radio station. So, you know, we launched a campaign. We put out word and we had people contribute and we bought a brand new diesel generator for Radio Ketchy. Purchased the United States, shipped to Guatemala, carried overland through the mountains and everything, set up. And they had it all set up and they plugged it in and they started the generator. And for about 10 minutes, they had their own power until that brand new generator a rod because it didn't come with oil and so that's what life is like if we live life without God see we are designed the, the Bible says in the very first chapter when God created us he made us different from our, everything else that he had made he breathed into us his spirit sets us uh, above all of the rest of creation and see we are made to run on God and this isn't just preacher talk. This isn't just Bible talk. This is real life. If we live life without God, we'll be like the generator at Radio Catchy. We'll throw a rod. Well, this book is the warning not to do that. And he goes on, you know, he, he surfaces a couple of times with something really good. Most of it is dark. Most of it is depressing. And most of it is just really negative. But he surfaces every once in a while. One of the times he did was in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Go ahead and show that slide if you would, DJ. He said this, He has made everything, here's the optimism here, beautiful in its time. Even Solomon, all the scars of disobedience and living life without God had that to say. He has also set, and here's the term, eternity in the human heart. You know, we're made to run on God. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. We're made to run on God. Eternity is set in our heart. A few weeks ago, Kelly's dad passed away. And a couple of days before his death, he was visiting with Larry, Kelly's youngest brother, the six of the children. And uh, he, the, by this time, his speech was very faint, but his mind was still crystal clear. And Larry said, I had to get really close. And we had some of these final conversations. And he said this. He said, Larry, this isn't the end. There's more than this. Eternity set in our hearts. Dan knew it. Two days before he drew his last breath, there's eternity in our hearts. What is eternity? I remember when I was a little bitty kid, my dad and mother both worked at a bank, and so they did numbers, and my parents were teaching me numbers, and I asked my dad, I remember, what's the largest number? He said, no, there's not one. I said, well, how can that be? There's got to be a biggest number. He said, no, no matter how big the number gets, you can always add one to it. And so I began then as a little bitty kid to give a sense of uh, what is eternal. Because, see, if numbers are infinite, then life is eternal. Because you can always add to it. And in an eternity's perspective, we realize that life isn't dinky. It's huge. 
It, it doesn't even have an end. You know, we see that in the stars when we look up. You know, astronomers are saying today, this is what they're wondering, if even the universe is without end. And so, doesn't that, wouldn't that make sense, though, that an eternal God would create a universe that is infinite, no end. And God put in our heart a sense that life is without end. It's without eternity. This week, you know, uh, it was showed up on Facebook, so I guess it's true, right? Uh, Elvis Presley's death went in 1977, wasn't it? This week. But guess what? Elvis is alive. Elvis is alive. Because when God put eternity in our hearts, that means it doesn't have an end. Elvis is alive. That's what Solomon was teaching us. Don't live life dinky, because life's not dinky. Remember the few examples that I shared with you last week of people who had excelled in different fields, and yet they got at the end of it and looked back and said, well, meaningless, worthless, it didn't count. Talked about Dean Oliver, the eight-time world champion calf roper. He got tired of it. He started playing golf because it didn't have ultimate meaning. Meaning. But then I'm thinking of Trevor Brazil. Does some of y'all know who he is? He's the, uh, he's the one who's won more all-round world titles in, in rodeo because he's a calf roper, a team roper, and a steer roper. And he's won more all-round all titles than anybody. But you know what? The difference between Dean Oliver, they got tired of it, didn't have any mean for him, and Trevor Brazil is for Trevor Brazil, his calf roping, is a platform from which he shares his faith. There are people who live in Del Rio, I know them by name, who've been impacted by his life because of that platform. He sees eternity in the hearts of men. And he uses something as trivial as roping calves as a platform from which to address the eternal nature of man. And he does it. He's impacting lives because of that. I also talked about, uh, you know, my friend who's a cattle rancher. After he retired, I wanted to talk to him, trying to connect with him. He said this, I don't even want to see a picture of a cow. I think he got tired of it, do you think? But then there's this man that we knew in Canada, Ted Perrin. And Ted was the most amazing man. He's one of these guys that gets up every morning like my now 13-year-old granddaughter. Can you believe it? We get to do it all over again. Just excited, and that's how Ted got up every morning. And uh, he was raising cattle. And he realized that he was appointed by God to be used by God to be a great steward of natural resources. And he turned that native prairie Canadian grass into nutritious beef that we all enjoy. And he knew that he was God's partner helping feed the world. He saw life from an eternal perspective. And Ted never got tired of it. Had meaning all the way. He never woke up in the morning and said, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. No, he couldn't wait to put his foot back in the stirrup. Because he was, in, he was cooperating with God to provide nutrition for those who will live forever. And he le never lost meaning of that. Let's see, I talked about my friend who went to law school and graduated, hated law, then went to medical school, got half tired of that and pulled the plug, and now he runs a hamburger joint, and I like hamburgers, I'm glad he does that. But those things lost meaning for him. And yet, there's my physician, my eye doctor, and uh, uh, Dr. Robert, we call him. And uh, here's what he does. He does surgeries, but at the beginning of every eye surgery, when he did mine, he did this. He said, Robert, this is Robert, and uh, we're about to do your surgery. Let's stop now and pray that God would direct my hands that this will all go well. You see, what's Robert Rice doing? He's practicing his life's calling in view of eternity. And he realized that he doesn't just operate on eyes. He treats people, and people have eternity in their hearts. He gives a month of his life every year. He goes down to South America and does eye surgeries for free. Living with eternity's perspective, not just man's perspective. Incredible example to me. 
Well, you know what? The Olympics will finish up today, and uh, we've heard some of the stories. There's been some drama throughout the weeks, as there not. But you know what? I've enjoyed. Go ahead and go to that next slide, if you would. Uh, there are some of these athletes who are not just, you know, doing flips off of boards, and they're not just running races, and they're not just swimming. They're using all of that giftedness and all of that discipline in this national stage to be able to share their faith. And here are those two of those guys. You know, I didn't even know there was such a thing as synchronized diving before. I guess I just hadn't been paying attention. But here's two of the guys who did it. And here's what one, you know, Steele Johnson said. This is actually David Bodia and Steele Johnson. He said, yeah, I'm Steele Johnson, the Olympian. But at the same time, I'm here to love and serve Christ from the international platform at the Olympics. My identity is rooted in Christ, not in the flips we're doing. Not doing life dinky, living life big in light of eternity. Such a great example. But you know what? Are there any other Olympic, are there any Olympic athletes in the room? No, probably not. But you know what? You don't have to be an Olympic athlete. You don't have to be a, a world champion to have that kind of platform. God has given each of us a similar platform in the lives that we live and what we're doing day in, day out. We're going to conclude today talking about that really holy task to which God has called you teachers and school administrators. And in fact, I'm going to, at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you guys to come forward because we want to pray for you as a new school year starts, school year starts tomorrow. But uh, there's a video that a friend from, of mine lives in Houston, goes to Tallywood Baptist Church. So if you can get that video ready there, uh, DJ, this would be a great time. This is a man who does something that many of us would think may be mundane. It would just be repetitious. But look at the way he uses his platform because man has eternity set in his heart. Okay, go ahead and show that, DJ. My name is Sonny Lewis. Every day I go to work, I know I'm going to meet people for God. And um, when they come into the store to looking for something, a TV, whatever, a computer, what they want, I find them a good price. And I build a relationship with them at work or what. When you meet somebody, you can talk to them nice. Be always laughful with people when you meet people. Laughing, laughing with people. The people already, already see you got a Jesus Christ on you because the way you present yourself. And then I put that 55 inch TV, they have a small car. They don't know why. They made them wish sweat outside to put the TV inside the car. The TV don't want to go. I say, you know what? I'm going to lend you my car. You can go with it. I got a van. You can take my car. He said, you're going to give me, lend me your car? You don't know me? I said, yeah, I know. Because God tell me to lend it to you. I know you're not going to be doing nothing because you know God. He said, I don't know God, but um, you're going to make me know God now. I wait for two hours before they bring the car to me. They come in inside the store looking for me. He said, I never see people like you. They give me a hug. And all of them give me a hug. Tell me, thank you so much. Huh? And at the same time, they say, I tell them, you're going to come to church and visit us. And they sometimes because I will <laughs> talk to them about the church already. They say, you don't, you don't have to tell me because I, I have to know those people. I tell them I'm a Christian. Sometimes they say, oh, I'm not a Christian, but I visit a church. But, uh, I say, I would, I would like to see you come visit my church. They say, sure, give me your number. And then uh, we, we, I change the number with them. After that, on then Saturday, I call them to remind them. They say, I'll be there. We might have uh, more than 10 people continue to come to church. And, and they own now, some of them is a member of Talowood. Some of them uh, continue to come to church, but they're not baptized yet. Some of them, I'm still talking, we, we're still friends, we still got a contact. I'm still talking to them about, um, can you, are you going to be baptized? They say, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, waiting again, but uh, I will, I will. But I believe God going to walk in with them. I bring them um, to, 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 tell, to let them know about Jesus Christ. Is it that good? You know, that man helps me even use the role that you let me do on Sunday mornings. It reminds me that this isn't dinky. Every Sunday morning when I have the privilege to stand before you, I, I do so out of great fear because I know that this is a sacred trust. And in this little bit of time, 
we'll be addressing things that last for eternity. And so more than that you would just like me and maybe be entertained a little bit by me and maybe have some thoughts provoked by some of the things that I say, I pray that this morning, that this counts for eternity because God has set eternity in our hearts. And so whether you're selling TVs in a store, maybe this man should be our next pastor. What do you think? <laughs> or if you're preaching, or if you're teaching children in the classroom, uh, you're enforcing the laws to keep our civilization civil. All of those, a platform for eternity, for eternity's sake. All of them. Can you picture yourself in what you're doing in life and living it with a perspective of eternity rather than just something temporal. You know, I'm just trying to make a paycheck so I can pay the bills. No. Something eternal going on. And it's that which is eternal. That's the point of it all. Some of you saw the little video I did this week, right? The ball of string. And I tied a knot in it. And the little dinky knot is still there. I can hardly see it from here. <laughs> There's a knot. And the ball of string. I'll go ahead and tie another one so you, can, you don't have to take my word for it. Okay, I'm taking this ball of string. And there, I've tied a knot in it. Now, here's what I think it's like to live life from a human perspective. Just to look at the knot. The dinky little knot. My friend uh, John Randalls used to put it this way. You know what? Each of us has a set number of days. The Bible even says... Uh, three score and ten, seventy years. And that's dinky. A little knot. John said, this is our time in our earth suit. <laughs> Do you like that? We all have time in an earth suit. And I'm representing it by this dinky little knot. But you know what? The knot is attached to this ball of string. I have no idea. Tom, can you help me? I have no idea how long this ball of string is. You want to help me figure that out? Sure. Let's see how long. Just take off down the aisle there. You can go that way. You can go any way you want to. Yeah, it's kind of tricky unrolling it. Yeah, it's like but it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, now what are you looking at now? You're looking at the long string in the ball, right? Not the dinky little knot. And if we live life, if we do our work this week, in such a way that we're just trying to sell TVs or trying to keep the same number of kids in the classroom so at the end of the day we found them all. We're just living life dinky. But just think of it. Life is connected to eternity. And if, if Tom could go all the way to the end of that ball of string, you know what we could do? We could always add another one to it. That's what eternity is. And when he got to the end of that string, you'd add another one to it. When you get to the end of that one, I go to Russell Hardware, we'll buy another ball of string, and, we'll, and we'll do, we could do that for the rest of our lives, couldn't we, Tom? Guys, let's don't do dinky. Let's live life in such a way that we take into account that this is eternity. Eternity's at stake. God has put eternity in our hearts. And more than that, it doesn't just because of me not to be dinky, because everyone that I will encounter this week living life that lasts forever and that we would treat the people that we share this planet with in such a way that we take into account eternity. Let's do that, okay? Will y'all do that with me? Yes. We can all become like the TV salesman. And you know what? We won't have to worry about greater commercials or greater websites. You know what? We will be impacting people's lives and part of that impact would even show up with how many people are here on a Sunday morning, wouldn't it? Yeah, that man knows 10 people in Tylerwood Baptist Church because he sells TVs. Wow, incredible. Tom, thanks. I appreciate You can just set it down right there. We'll just leave it out there. And I'll string it across here, and I'll leave it right there. Okay. Eternity. God has set eternity in our hearts. But you have to get all the way to the end of Proverbs. Just go ahead and go to the ne that next slide, okay, DJ? Here's how he finally finishes. Man, he finishes great. Man, he's bogged down in the mud for 12 long chapters. And the next to the last verse in this book, he says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Hey guys, I've lived life. I've made huge mistakes. I'm looking at it all now. And this is my conclusion. Old man at the end of life. Fear God. 
keep his commandments. And this is the whole of man. Fear God. What does that mean? That mean to be afraid of him? Oh no, I hope he doesn't come. No, it means I'm in awe of you. That you would put eternity in my heart because you are an eternal God. I'm in awe of you. That's what fear God means. To live life in awe. Wake up in the morning like Ted Perrin. I can't believe it. I get to be a steward of God's resource and feed his people to live in awe of him. And then he did say, he went on to say, part of what it means to live in awe is to keep his commandments. He said, I've broken them all. I can show you the scars. I have a written record of when I broke the boundaries, the consequences that followed. He's begging us. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Fear God. Follow him. Man, that makes this eternity of which we're, in which we're participants, oh, it's not boring, is it? Man, it's cool. It's really exciting. As a senior in college, I was about to graduate with a degree in agriculture. I hoped to be a cowboy. I wanted to raise cows. I wanted to be like Ted Perry. But God had a different plan, and I remember the conversation. I mean, it's so clear to me, I would have never come up with this on my own. He said, Robert, think about it. A cow lives 10 years. Yeah, a cow lives about 10 years. Give you about 10 calves. Right. He said, people live forever. What do you want to give your life to? And because of that, I went to seminary, and I've been privileged to be able to live life from a perspective of eternity, because people last forever. Let's do that. Let's do that. Tomorrow morning, in case you hadn't noticed, school starts. Yeehaw, right kids? Yeah, you know, I haven't heard a yeehaw from a single one of you yet. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> but you know what? If it were not for the teachers, <laughs> if it were not for the teachers, it would be a disaster, wouldn't it? And so what, I'm going to do that. You know, I warned you a little while ago. And I want all of our teachers, if you just come on and stand and, and come down here to the front, we want to all pray for you. If you're a teacher or if you're in school administration, go ahead and do it. Don't embarrass me. Okay, y'all come on, y'all come on. And in school administration, Sonia, you're in on that. Yeah, all you guys come forward. You who are going to be teaching our kids and our grandkids and the kids and grandkids of our neighbors and friends. You know, this is a holy calling. And I'm so thankful for you. And I asked Roy if I could share his example with you again. You know what? Roy went to uh, Del Rio High School. Or was it San Felipe, Roy? San Felipe. And uh, he was just kind of going through the motions and made a lot of mistakes, didn't you, in high school? Oh, he was like the class president, but some other things too were going on. But you know what? A teacher saw eternity in Roy's heart, and he called him out. And he said, Roy, you're made for more than this. Don't do dinky. And he, he said, Roy, I can get you a scholarship, and you can go to Howard Payne University. And Roy's going, university? Do you know where I'm from? And he said, yeah, I do. And so Roy went to Howard Payne. I'll go ahead and tell him, you were on scholastic probation after your first semester, right? But instead of running about, you, you said, okay, I got to get down to business. I can't do this dinky. I'm going to give my all to this. And he graduated. He came back to Del Rio, and guess what he did? He taught school. And he looked in those little kids' eyes and he saw eternity in their hearts. And then he became a principal, got his master's degree at Sol Ross because a teacher saw eternity in Roy's life, in his heart. So that's why, teachers, we thank God for you. And tomorrow I hope it's not only chaos, but that, uh, that God will be able to, uh, that you will see in those little children's eyes, eternity in their hearts. And that as you nurture them and bless them, then eternity's fruit will become apparent just like it is right there in the life of Roy Muskies. Let me pray for you, and this is how we'll end, okay? Let's do. Lord, th Lord thank you. that You didn't make any of us dinky. You didn't make any of us little. That you 
have put eternity in our hearts. And then you've given us the incredible privilege of treating the people around us. Is that part of your creation that lasts forever? So Lord, pray you'll bless these teachers really good. That every morning you'll have to help them be like Ted Perrin. That they can't believe that they get to do this again. And that uh, you will give them students who they can love on and bless and that the children who come to their classes will know that they've encountered somebody who knows you and that they're really, really important. Pray that you'll bless them really good, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, teachers, administrators, for all you do for all of our kids. Yeah. Well, we are going to finish uh, with an invitation. And maybe Solomon got through to you. Don't do dinky. And uh, maybe you want to just tell the rest of us, hey, y'all, you know what? I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to live life in light of eternity. And whatever that looks like, I mean, who can fathom? That's what Solomon said. Who can fathom? No, we really can't. All we can do is illustrate with a dinky little ball of string. But the, I'm going to commit before all of these people, I'm not going to do life dinky, and I'm going to live in light of eternity.